Hey everybody, Riley Holland here, and I'm here once again with Robert Grossman, the wellness business systematologist. How you doing, Robert? Great, Riley. Just back from vacation and glad to be talking with you today. Nice. Well, welcome back, and I'm excited to be talking too because the topic today is one of immense interest for me, and I think should be of immense interest to anybody with their own business, and that is systematizing your business. Now, this is a concept that kind of took me a while to get. At first, I thought it was kind of a general way to talk about just how to do business. You know, you're the wellness business systematologist. Your company is Wellness Prosperity Systems. At first, I just kind of thought it was a way to talk about this. But over the course of months of working with you closely, developing my own business, and essentially revolutionizing the way I think about how I'm doing what I'm doing, I realized that this is a very, very specific and very, very powerful concept, this idea of systematizing. So I'm very glad that we're going to be talking about it in detail. So before we get into the concept in general, the concept as a whole, I thought it might be useful to reflect on the big moments for me in my particular business when it kind of clicked for me that systematizing was going to be the key where, honestly, every time that if you and I get on a coaching call, Every time I feel like I'm up against a wall, suddenly you show me there's a door right there and it's usually some form of systematizing what I'm doing. So let me give a concrete example before we go too abstract here for people. The very beginning. That sounds great since we've been working through step by step little increments of systematizing your business in kind of bite-sized pieces. So I think it'd be terrific if you could share some of your experiences, what that's been like for you, how it's affected your experience working and how it's affected the results you're getting and just the way your business operates. Great. So this will be good too because this is the way that I grasped the concept, not by having it explained to me as a whole, which probably wouldn't have gotten through my skull in the first place, but actually being kind of in the trenches and then watching it do its magic. So my business is based on this practice called neuromuscular release work. It's a type of, you might say, mind-body healing, blah, blah, blah. There were all sorts of ways that I was talking about it, and I realized I didn't have precise language for it. And then one of the main principles that we dealt with right away was the idea that it has to be focused on a very specific market, a very specific group of people, because otherwise, how are they going to understand that what you do is going to benefit them? If you try to be everything to everybody, you're going to be no one to anyone, that kind of thing. So for me, the process kind of led me to seeing that I was going to be targeting competitive athletes specifically. Okay, good. That's a great place to start. But first thing, Robert, that you had me do there was go through a very systematic and very, you know, pretty rigorous and all-encompassing research project where, first of all, I went and I found out, is this actually going to be a market that's going to give back? And once that was clear, what are, because I do a lot of my business online, what are the search terms, the keywords, the very specific groups of languaging that this particular market uses? And then what other language, what general kind of emotional language do they use so that I can talk about what I do in their language? Now, this was a very systematic process. And what I ended up with were a few core keyword terms that I now use in everything and now the very fundamental basis of all of the copywriting that I do, of all of the SEO, search engine optimization that I do, of any targeted online advertising that I would do is built solidly on this foundation of having these particular keyword terms. So that was the first thing. And I'll just give one other example right now, and then maybe we can jump to others. More recently, my whole system of productivity has undergone a revolution. Now, this is about as on the other end of the spectrum, I guess, as it gets from market research. But this just shows how universally this notion applies, and it's just starting to get through my skull that this is kind of the answer, and it's going to continue to be the answer. So I noticed that I was getting a little overwhelmed with all of the tasks, the little things, all the stuff I had to do. So I got on a call with Robert. We talked about systematizing productivity. And now I have a system. 
And it's not that I have to work harder. It's not that I have to do more, really. It's just that now there's a system through which to flow my energies rather than putting the same amount of energy into a leaky boat and just watching it all kind of slip through my fingers to mix as many metaphors as possible. So there's a sort of a broad stroke. How does that sound, Robert, for kind of a little bit of a concrete introduction to what this is? Yeah, I like that. I appreciate your sharing some of your experience with it. And those are just a couple examples of what we've done. I mean, for me, actually, this idea of systematizing, there's a lot of different levels of it. There's the most specific level of actually building systems in the business, like a marketing system, which can deliver tremendous return on investment by bringing in new clients month after month, year after year. But there's also the more abstract level of it, the more philosophical level of systematization, which is the idea that everything we do in our business should be, we should see it precisely. If we're aiming for a target, we have to know exactly what that target is. It's not enough to just have a fuzzy, vague idea. We really need to understand what we're doing to have some clear definition, what we're aiming for, to have a clear structure within which to work, because it just creates the framework that you can use to make everything you do more powerful and more effective. I really see that as foundational. And it's incredible how few business owners do it. In fact, it's almost unheard of. You never hear people talking about the process of systematizing a business. I went through two years of business school and 20 years in the management consulting industry. And I can count on half the fingers of one hand the number of times I ever heard anybody mention it. So it's really kind of an overlooked gem in our arsenal of tools that we can use to improve our businesses and our work. Well, I wonder too if that's partially because, as you've mentioned in other interviews, that the already existing kind of old paradigm structure of business already has a lot of its systems built into it such that they cannot really be modified. They're not really open for discussion. Whereas new paradigm, as you call it, entrepreneurs, business owners, people who are doing it in a new way and doing it themselves, they have to sort of build these systems themselves from scratch if they're going to be adapting to the changing times. And, you know, there's a pitfall on either side. Either you don't systematize at all, which is where I was leaning dangerously before we started working, and then systematizing, I guess, too rigidly and maybe based on the old paradigm, that middle path, and realizing, as you say, how fundamental this is. Every time we've worked on something that's a systematization, I said to myself, I cannot believe that I ever thought that I could do what I'm trying to do without this piece. It's an enormous leveraging point. Yes, it's a leveraging point. And you know, I think you're right what you said, that one of the things that holds people back is the fact that we already have so many of the systems on which business is based kind of built into the culture of business. It's built into the standard way that businesses operate. This is one of the main factors that drove me out of the mainstream big business world and led me toward working with small business owners who have more flexibility because so many of those baked in legacy systems are not only antiquated, but they're completely dysfunctional. I mean, a lot of them are based on decades of corporate managers trying to operate within this labyrinthine system of constraints and find the, you know, the lesser of all possible evils or to find compromise ways to meet the needs of their boss and different stakeholders and all the different reasons why bad decisions are made in big businesses. And that becomes the standard way that business operates. And when I first started thinking about the new paradigm business model, one of the things that dawned on me, and I, I remember it was like a blinding insight, it was that every single process inside of a business, from the very first to the very last process, even in terms of leadership, in terms of administration, in terms of sales and marketing, in terms of service delivery, everything we do can be rethought and realigned with the first principles or with fundamental principles, with some sort of a consistent, integrated, holistic approach that basically lines up those systems. It's like if you think of your business as a system through which energy flows. I think that's a good way to think of what a business is, a system through which energy flows. If the processes within the business 
are designed based on compromise and based on false premises, then the energy just simply is not going to flow through very well. And that means that energy is wasted. It means that as a business owner, you're going to be investing far more time to deliver far less results. It means that your clients are getting only a fraction of the benefit that they could be getting. So it's really almost a starting point for the way I think about business is that it lets line everything up with the fundamental principles and make it work. No compromise, but rather keeping the goal in mind and just using a good solid understanding of the fundamentals to redesign the basic systems in a business and allow them to operate more cleanly. Let that energy flow without obstruction. Well, I see the holistic element here at play, even in what you're saying right now, because of course, in order to build those systems based on that goal, you need to have, as you mentioned before, a very, very clear, focused, targeted goal in the first place. All of this works as one, even though we kind of boil it down, analyze in very small pieces all the different systems. They all work together almost like a body. That's right, it does. We do look at it in little pieces and the interesting thing is you can achieve great results just by taking one little aspect of your business and working on systemizing that. And actually that's exactly what I do with new clients. We don't start doing everything at once. We take baby steps. Even with very small changes, you can have a very big impact if you choose the right leverage points to adjust. So that's what we do. Usually we begin with the aspects of the business that make the most difference to the clients and we start from there and ultimately you can build it out into a beautiful elegant holistic approach to business where everything is really lined up and if you do that you're going to achieve tremendous exponential growth but you can also just take one aspect of your business and focus on that and once you start to systematize and once you start to take advantage of the benefits that that systematization process offers, you can achieve tremendous results very simply just by focusing on key leverage points inside the business, even just one or two things. Well, I'm struck by what you said about energy flowing through the system. You've been talking to me this way for a while, and it's really helped me to kind of visualize and conceptualize how the whole business works and can work and should function. And I remember on a call with you, not long ago, you had this great metaphor, flow and force. And I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit. The idea, because I'm maybe like some other people who are listening, it kind of identify as a flow person. I'm sort of resistant to what I might perceive as constraint and too rigid a structure. One thing that I've sort of been conditioned towards working on all this stuff is that no, 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 there must be structure. And I remember he said something that really struck me, which is he said mastery in any area is a transitioning from force to flow. Now, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that kind of general idea in the context of building systems, because someone might say, well, doesn't building a system interfere with flow and spontaneity and organic creativity? Yeah, I, I used to think it did too. I guess it was four or five years ago, I was with my wife in Amsterdam and we were attending a seminar held by a Zen master, Genpo Roshi. And he was talking to us about his experiences in 30 years of Zen practice and he was talking about the whole awakening experience. And a young lady in the audience raised her hand and she asked him about how she could balance her energies, her male and female energies specifically. And she said she just hates the way male masculine energy feels. It feels to her aggressive, it feels to her pushy. She's a woman and she wants to express only feminine energies in her life. And is that okay? And I'm paraphrasing, but he basically said, that's not okay, you need both. Because the feminine energy, he said, is like raw life force that just explodes out, it gushes. But the masculine energy is that focus that directs it in a specific place. So if you just gush energy everywhere, you actually don't achieve anything. You have very little impact on the world. You have very little ability to give to others that way. It's like uh, you know pouring a bucket of water on the ground. But if you combine it with some sense of focus and direction and structure, then all of that energy becomes immensely powerful and you can do tremendous things with it. So that model has always been in my mind ever since then. And I think it really applies 
in business too, and it really applies to the flow versus force. We're at a point in history where we have spent hundreds of years, or maybe thousands of years, in a culture that's dominated by a masculine, forceful approach to life in general, but especially to business. If you look at all our cultural stereotypes of business, they're very masculine, aggressive, everything is goal-oriented. You hit targets, you initiate strategic thrusts. It's even in the language of business. But we're at a point in history where more and more people on this planet are starting to wake up to the fact that maybe that's not the only way. And it's like how a martial arts master using no force but just flowing can absolutely dominate a lesser fighter who's using force in the fight. That's how I think that this David versus Goliath battle that we're seeing today will play out eventually with the giant corporations. They have this force-based approach to everything they do. For example, I did a lot of work early in my career management consulting with banks and insurance companies, financial industries. And we would have these conversations where the management of these companies was basically trying to come up with more and more clever product constructions that would basically trick their clients into paying them more profits. I actually thought it was appalling. But today, they still do that today, by the way. They haven't changed in I haven't seen any sign that they're about to. But there's more and more small businesses that are out there with a genuine desire to serve their clients and help others. Getting rich is a side effect in a business like that. And it turns out it works much better. People today are very sophisticated. The markets and customers, they understand when they're trying to be tricked and they understand when they're receiving service from someone who really cares. I feel like I'm talking around the edge of the question, but not really hitting the center of it, though. You were asking about flow versus force in business, and I... I think that you nailed it with that story of the Zen guy, and also what you were saying about the force versus flow, the martial artist who can flow will beat the martial artist who's relying entirely on force, but the martial artist that can flow is flowing within a system, Right. Absolutely. Anybody who's practiced martial arts knows there's basic moves and techniques that you have to practice thousands and thousands of times to learn the fundamentals. That is the system. That's right. Yeah, so we're not just talking about putting flowers in gun barrels, right? We're talking about actually making something happen with all of that good intention. Well, that's the balance that the Zen master Genpo Roshi was talking about. A master martial artist has a perfect balance of masculine and feminine energies. He's flowing, but within a structure. Yeah, and I think that that balance element, because it's so easy, as we've talked about before, to throw out the baby with the bathwater, to want to go all the way to the other pole, to the other side and stay there. Because as you say, that our current culture is overemphasized, what you might call a masculine approach. So you might want to swing all the way into the other direction, but then you look around years later and you realize, oh, I haven't actually made anything happen here. Nothing's necessarily different. And I think that balance also happens with the creative and destructive, for example. When we were working on all of this really focused and clear and deliberate systematization in my business, first of all with the research process and everything from then on, boy, did I have to deal with some destruction of my own assumptions and illusions and ideas and wishes and hopes and fantasies about how this was going to be. Because that's what happens when you're only flowing without structure. You get all these bright ideas and you get attached to them. But if you want to actually connect what you're doing to the world, and that's what I see as the overall system is, is that the energy flows in both directions, you to the world, the world back to you, hopefully in a beneficial way for both, then you do have to be willing to surrender some of your illusions, and that can be a little bit of a harsh thing. Not terrible, but a little bit, and you have to be ready for that. That's true, but it's still better than the alternative. You know, I talk with a lot of business owners who are kind of trapped inside their own business. There's some core to what they do, something that totally comes from the heart and just lights up their passion, and that's why they got into the business in the first place. Like in your case, it's the personal work you do with clients that's really at the heart of your business. That's what gets you out of bed in the morning. And most of the people who I work with have something like that. There's some inner gift that they're trying to give. 
and they decided to create it as a business because that's the way the world works and they have to you know they have to do something so do what they love and that makes perfect sense but then they begin to get overwhelmed with the operation and the administration of the business they realize they have to sell and they have to get clients and that's pretty distasteful to a lot of people and it's a burden for a lot of people and I talk with a lot of people who they tell me they love what they do but they experience their business as a burden at least in part and when we start to systematize some of the aspects of the business especially systematizing all of the components of the business that surround and support and contextualize the central personal human genius function around which the whole thing is designed then suddenly the business owner experiences a tremendous freeing up of all this energy that was locked up in the simple operations of the business and solving the problems every day and all the stuff that business owners have to do once that stuff is running smoothly it creates a space where now your energy is free and now you have a clear space and you can really do the things that light you up and the things that you love and the rest is gonna work because it's well designed and it's built properly as a business system I love that we've talked about this before other elements of business to someone who's not necessarily someone who identifies as being interested in business per se but someone who has a business can seem like such a burden up front just because it's doing something new but once you get into it and you realize how much it's freeing up for you, you also get to realize, oh, it's helping you to build these systems. You're putting your own fingerprint on every aspect of your business and you're kind of owning it more. You don't feel like you're in someone else's territory so much. So I'm in the business world when I do X, Y, Z, whereas I'm in my comfort zone when I do this other stuff. It all becomes your own territory. That's absolutely right. And that affects the business in profound ways as well. I mean, you wouldn't think of it that necessarily that there are so many aspects of the business which aren't directly touching the clients, but in fact, everything that happens in the business does touch the clients somehow, either directly or indirectly. And when you own it all, and when you design your own business systems in the specific way that supports the core mission and vision of that business, then it just becomes something that's so integrated, so consistent, it totally changes the client's experience and we have some examples like that also even in the world of big business there are examples like that you know it when you go into a business and the mission is integrated and everything they do kind of communicates that same central proposition which is the reason why you're there that's extremely powerful for the business owner as well but for the clients as well it has this galvanizing effect on the whole business I think that's like the prerequisite to create explosive or exponential growth in a business. You know, the systematizing in order to free up time and everything too makes me think of, you know, the Greek god Hephaestus, who was the blacksmith god who created all of the other gods stuff. He created for himself some robot automaton helpers. He was kind of the first systematizer in the Greek pantheon. And then I associate that with, like right now I have one thing that you really helped me with was creating an email autoresponder series so that people could sign up for it and then they get a series of emails with a very carefully constructed message for me to help them learn about what I do that, as you put before, is centralized based on my overall kind of mission thing, which you also helped me figure out. And while I'm still working on it and have not yet promoted it, really, there is already a steady little trickle of people signing up. And when you can show up to work or your desk or whatever, and the first thing you see is that while you were sleeping, something happened thanks to the systems that you built. Those little automatons are out there doing things for you, bringing your message to people. That's extremely energizing. Yes, it is. And you know, that's a great example of what you asked me earlier, the question I felt that I hadn't quite touched the center of about flow versus force in business, because you're talking about the process of bringing new people into your fold. And that's the sales and marketing process. And it's so difficult and distasteful and burdensome to so many business owners. 
it also happens to be the absolute key to having a business that actually creates profits and puts food on the table. You've got to have clients. But when you know the way we're doing it, it's attraction marketing. You're putting a little bit of yourself out there, putting out your message, your ideas, your personality, and you're attracting through your message the people who resonate with that message. They're already your ideal clients. They already like you. They already are looking for someone like you. They're looking for someone who can give them what you can do. And it takes the aggressivity out of the sales process. It's very gentle. You're actually sharing and you're giving something of, that's very precious, your own knowledge and your, your expertise. You're giving something of yourself. But by giving that in a carefully structured way, you create relationships with the exact people who are most likely to become your best clients. That's what attraction marketing is, and I think it's incredibly powerful. It has a whole slew of advantages. Just in pure business and financial terms, it has a whole slew of advantages when it's compared with the traditional aggressive force-based sales and marketing that probably 95% of the businesses in the world today practices. So there are so many good reasons to start to implement this type of thinking in any small business. Yeah, that makes me think too of our discussion about the new paradigm, old paradigm of business, where in the new paradigm, the things that are most beneficial to your clients are the things that are also most beneficial to your business. So there's no board meetings of how can we trick people. And if you just think about it as one of those general principles, and you think, well, the thing that's going to most effectively bring me clients and the clients that I want is also the thing that's going to be most beneficial for the people who are interested or might be interested in what I do. Everything clicks and falls together. And now I know that when that stuff goes out, and it's all open for revision, of course, as time goes on, but it's stuff that someone asked for by signing up, for one thing, so I'm not just all over them. And it's something that I'm actually very proud of. Like you said, it is an outgrowth of who I am and what I do. And I think that it's valuable. Now, the other side to that is it is systematized and it is done intelligently and deliberately. It does incorporate the research that I did. And it is, for example, an email sign up rather than just writing all this stuff and putting it on a blog somewhere. Because one thing that I learned about how these business systems work is that people are going to make their buying decisions in their email box rather than just going to some random blog somewhere. So that's the more hardcore element that had to be part of the scaffolding to make the whole thing work. But then once you learn all that stuff, yes, the creativity flows through it. And it's really a revolution in the way that you start to see what you do and these elements of your business that you may have previously disowned. Yeah, exactly. You know, this is a little bit philosophical, but as we talk about this, it's reminding me of a few years ago, I went through a period of time when I was intensely studying basically every spiritual and religious system in the world, just trying to understand what it's all about. And one of the most interesting systems that I looked at was the Kabbalah, the secret teachings of Judaism. The Kabbalah has a, a premise in it that the divine power is everywhere and it's available to all of us, but we are flawed vessels. We're not able to hold it. So you don't need to, to look for, for God or money or health or happiness or sex or toys or anything. You don't need to look for it. It's all there. It's waiting to comfort to you. It wants to come to you, but you are a flawed vessel and you can't hold it, and your business is a flawed vessel, and your business can't hold all the potential that it has, but that potential is all there. So what you do is you focus on, instead of focusing on trying to get stuff, you focus on trying to repair the vessel, patch the holes in the bucket so that it can hold water. And that's exactly the process of systematizing a business. We look for the biggest holes in the bucket, and we start patching them up. And as the business becomes more solid, less of a flawed vessel, more able to act as a conduit for energy, for the particular 
flavor of energy that you give to your clients, whatever that is. It could be accounting services, it could be a great massage, it could be something you teach or a product you manufacture. That's all different brands or different flavors of energy that you're giving to your clients, but your business is leaking through the gaps and the flaws. So when you patch those up, then it just becomes an efficient vessel, a robust vessel, and all the success just kind of comes. One day, the systems are working and the clients are coming. They're coming by attraction. They're not coming because you're out there pounding the streets, knocking on doors, trying to sell vacuum cleaners to housewives. They're coming because your message is out there in the world. And people are getting it because we live in this kind of interconnected Google search world. And when you put out a message that has authenticity, then people listen to it and they, they come to you. Like you said, you wake up in the morning and things have happened. You have a list of people waiting to hear from you. You are cultivating and developing relationships with those people. You're doing it in a way that has some structure to it. I mean, your emails, just talking about the example you mentioned, your emails are filled with your personality. They're authentic and they're very, very human. But as you said, they're designed according to a structure and a system and they go out at certain times and you don't have to figure that out every single time a new person comes to your website or calls you on the phone or asks you for information. It's designed and it works. And that frees up your energy to do the next thing. That's how we make the vessel of our business less flawed and just allow the impact to develop over time. And it develops surprisingly fast once you get the basics in place. Yes, and thinking of it in those terms, I mean, that just made me reflect too because I sort of have come to see writing those emails as an art form. It's a specific kind of art form that's somewhat new but, for example, I'm signed up to certain people's lists where, yes, they're offering their services, but they're also offering a lot of value. And I'm just a fan. I love to read what these guys put together and what they do. And I'm inspired by it. But then you think, oh, having it systematized and having it targeted like that and having a structure of a particular way for that particular art form of writing an email to go to your list, that's certainly nothing new. If we think in terms of creativity and art forms, you know, a Shakespearean play has five acts, sonnets put together in a particular way, you know, epic poetry is put together in a particular way, and then within that structure flows the creative spirit of the author. It makes me think again of what you said about new paradigm business, which is that we're not, these aren't new ideas per se. These are ancient, true to the human tendencies ideas, but we're applying them now in a different way. So it's that wonderful mix of the cutting edge and the archaic. Exactly, exactly. It's the application that's new. It's the first principles are first principles. They're unchanging. Wow, well, that's really empowering to think of. It's also, I think, very empowering, humbling at first, but very empowering to realize that, as you said, to patch the boat, and I love that metaphor because it puts things into your hands, into your control, where you realize, oh, this actually, this business should or could be doing whatever I want it to be doing. And the fact that it's not doing that means that I'm doing something wrong. Yeah, exactly. I think a lot of times when we feel frustrated or vaguely dissatisfied with something, what's actually happening is confusion. We don't know what's the next step to take that's going to lead us where we want to go. We're confused in a subtle way that we don't always recognize as confusion. But when you have that clarity and you understand what you have to do right now, what do you have to do tomorrow morning, then it's much easier you wake up, you know what you have to do, you do it, and you're motivated because you understand that it's the next step on the path toward your goal. The confusion lifts, and that's just one more way that it frees up energy and it creates this kind of flow where you're moving from one step to the other, always strengthening the vessel bit by bit, a little bit more, and it's completely empowering because you own that vessel, that leaky bucket was created by you and you have the power 
to modify it, change it, upgrade it in any way that you want. So once you get that, and once you understand the way that bucket is designed and the different tools and options and strategies, methods, tactics, approaches, mindsets, philosophies that you can apply in different ways to add robustness to it, then you find that you have a very concrete and specific, almost a to-do list, which is not just taking care of the immediate job, the immediate task that needs to be done today, but it's strengthening the system of your business in a way that lasts. It's a way that's permanent, a way that you can build on the next day. And that's why sometimes there's this kind of surprise where the actual success, the financial results, the real world impact kind of sneaks up on you from behind and it's like, boom, suddenly it's working. And that's just because you just found a hole in the bucket that you didn't know was there before and you patched it up and suddenly that bucket's filling up with water and it's holding it. Yeah, and finding a way to do that where you're not overwhelmed and you don't fall into that kind of confusion so that you are taking those baby steps. I remember one phrase that you used that really stuck with me was don't boil the ocean and then the rest just kind of happens and we said about confusion I'm working on this productivity stuff that's been my homework the last week with you I've been reflecting on a course on hypnosis that I took years ago from hypnosis motivation institute and their definition of how you get into hypnosis was that when you're overwhelmed it's not when you're relaxed it's when you're overwhelmed by they called it information units or something like that. Just stuff coming at you or in your head, then you retreat into hypnosis. Basically, if you've got a lot of stuff on your mind, you go into hypnosis out of anxiety. Now, think about that in terms of productivity and procrastination and that paralysis that comes from being confused, from not knowing what to do next, from being overwhelmed and not feeling empowered. Whereas if just one at a time you get these things systematized, they're out of your head, they're somewhere now. There's so much about my business right now that I'm not thinking about at all, but I know that I cannot think about it because I know that it's there, outside of me, externalized into a system. So then you can focus on those little things with confidence and take those step-by-steps and accomplish the great task by a series of small acts. Yeah, precisely. You're free from all of the mental clutter, and you can really focus on the things that make the next difference. You, you want a cup of tea, so instead of boiling the ocean, you boil one cup of water. And it's quick and easy, and it actually works. Beautiful. Well, speaking of not boiling the ocean, I think that you were right earlier when you predicted that maybe this is going to be two conversations, because... I feel like this was a great kind of talk about some of the general principles, but it would be nice to dedicate a whole nother one of these to talking about some of the details of systematizing. How does that sound to you? I do see we've been talking for quite a while, so I would love to continue later and next time maybe talk about more specific actual key actions that the business owner can take to start to actually capture some of the benefits of systematization in his business. Great, because I know there's plenty to talk about in that aspect too for our part two, and hopefully we've at least seduced the listeners into lending an ear for the more hardcore tactical actual taking action part. Yeah, let's hope so. Let's hope so. (laughs) All right, Robert, well, always a pleasure and always so much to think about after these talks. Much appreciated and welcome back from your vacation and I look forward to part two. Uh, Thanks so much, Riley. Have a great day. Bye-bye.